Dear friends, today there will be a class on European state formation. Basically, we'll be taking a look at the evolution and the various types and the differences and the variations of European political thought. We will be concerned with the evolution, the changes, the continuities in European political thought. How Europeans and European civilization has devised and termed Used, made the various terms for its usage in the political sphere. What is the structure, the systems, the institutions of European political life? Basically, we can say that European state formation, European political thought has three main parts. One is that of antiquity, Greece and Rome, we all know. Then a medieval Europe in which we have the, the big and the important role of church. We have the role of church, we have feudalism, we have various manorial lords, etc. Various wars and fights, the contestation between church and the state. And then, after French Revolution, we can say there is a beginning of modern Europe, modern European political thought. And then also, as a corollary, the export of European political thought into the new world, the free world, so to say, USA. The political thought of USA would be a corollary of European political thought. We will look into all these aspects one by one as we go along. So, let us begin with antiquity, Greece and Rome. We all know that in antiquity, the Bronze Age, civil Bronze Age civilization of Athens and Sparta, etc., we have such illuminating and illuminating names of big philosophers, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. These are the foundations on which European political thought is based, state formation is based. We can safely say that in antiquity, a very big imprint is that of Socrates and his associate Plato. Plato and Socrates have a big role to play. The very important book of Republic, by Plato and a book called Politics by Aristotle. Both Aristotle and Plato, they, have, they play a very big role. And the main running theme of this political thought, state formation of ancient Europe, is the concept of philosopher king. Again and again it is mentioned in, uh, in the literature, in, in politics, in Republic, by Socrates, by Plato, by Aristotle, that a king has to be a philosopher, or the philosopher should have kingly duties. Now, this is a very important concept. In antiquity, we find that the roles, the duties, and the responsibilities of a king are many and varied. But the most important aspect is that Europe, right from this very old times, made a distinction between metaphysics, philosophy, and theology, and religion. We, we say that in Europe, there is a separation between church and state. We all know that. This is a very modern phenomenon. But we say that there's a difference, there is a distinction between church and state. But we must not forget that right from antiquity, in the works of philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and within the concept of the philosopher king, we find a very important distinction. The distinction between theology, that is religion, the practice of religion, the theory of religion, ritual aspects of religion, and its theology, its logic, its knowledge, its logos, theology and philosophy. Philosophy, meaning the morality of good and bad, justice and injustice, philosophy meaning equality, Philosophy meaning rights and duties. So the philosophical aspects of political life and the philosophical aspects of uh, social life, philosophical aspects of economic life, those are separated, differentiated from religious activities, religion or theology. This happens in antiquity itself. So we must try to understand that today when we speak of the separation of church and the state, how what is the European concept of secularism? What is the European concept of democracy? 
all these things have their seeds in the in the hallowed antiquity and in the hoary past of ancient Europe, particularly that of Greece, Athens, Sparta, and then later Rome, which we will see subsequently. But there is a caveat. If Aristotle is talking of the Republic, if Plato is talking of, uh, uh, of politics, and they are talking of a concept of the philosopher king, but then we find that one of the examples of their philosopher king is Alexander the Great. Alexander, who took on a campaign of massive annexation, warfare, invasion, and constant bloodshed and arson and violence. This is another aspect of European state formation and European political thought. The philosophy might be that of a philosopher king. The ideal may that be of democracy. The ideal may be, may, the, may be of justice and justice. But ultimately what Europe comes out with as an example is something like Alexander. So this is another dichotomy or another contradiction in European political thought. The theory might be good, but Europe never succeeds in giving a good example of the theories that it sets. <laughs>
Roman political thought state formation has three major parts. The first is pagan Rome. Pagan Rome, which has Jupiter and other pagan gods. It has uh, the, 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 the concept of uh, uh, polytheism, many gods, Poseidon, uh, uh, Jupiter, etc., many gods. Roman emperors followed one, one of these gods. The concept, as we have already discussed, that in Europe, the religious aspect, theological aspect, and philosophical aspects have been separated. So Roman kings or Roman senators, if they followed any particular god, somebody might be following Jupiter, somebody might be following Poseidon, it's up to them. But this had very little impact on the functioning of the senate, functioning of the army, functioning of the judiciary system, etc., etc. So this is a pagan system in which there are many pagan gods and there is little or no interference between the religious beliefs of the Roman citizens and the religious belief of the king or the senators or the, or the leaders of the tribune. Then we come to a second part. In the first part we saw a king, but the king was elected and there was democracy, Roman democracy, run by the Senate and the Tribune. In the second part of Roman state formation, we find the time of tyrannical rulers, tyrannous, tyranny, dictatorship. So another aspect of modern European thought, dictatorship, autocracy, tyranny, has its roots again in ancient Europe, ancient Europe in ancient Rome. The first dictator or the first absolute ruler, the first absolute king was Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar bypassed the Senate. The tribune was totally made uh, uh, powerless and all the power was uh, taken over by Julius Caesar. And in modern Europe, in medieval Europe, we find that Caesar became such an important name that the Russian kings, they used to call themselves Tsar which is a Slavic word or a Russian word for Caesar. Caesar in Russian is Tsar. They used to call them Tsars. The German kings, the German emperors, the, the Prussian kings, they used to call themselves Kaiser. Kaiser in German is Caesar. So Caesar becomes a very important word, a very important idea, the idea of the absolute king. Now this is another part of, of Roman political thought as well as the legacy that it takes over to modern European political thought. The third part of Roman political thought comes after 337 common era when Emperor Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine, he takes over and he, 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 he adopts Christianity. Christian Rome is a, is a third kind of political structure, third state formation in ancient Rome. That is the Christian Rome. In ancient Greece and in pre-Christian Rome, philosophy and theology were different. But the moment the Roman emperor becomes Christian, the philosophical aspects, the rational, the non-religious aspects and <coughs> church or the religious aspects, the control of <coughs> Christian theology over philosophy, over non-religious philosophy. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, even Roman writers, Roman uh, 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 poets and writers, they don't have any religion. They don't say we belong to this religion, that religion. They're all pagan. They might be worshipping some god. But their philosophy is about quote unquote secular things, justice, injustice, equality, jobs, education, health, civic life, social liberties, citizen rights, duties, liberties. So truth, false. So philosophy is about morals, about social life, civic life, citizenry, etc, etc. But the moment either pagan, either through a senate, through a democracy or in a tyrannical system of Julius Caesar. From this pagan and pre-Christian system, 
Rome becomes Christian, not only does it become monotheistic, Europe also becomes, removes the fine distinction between philosophy and theology. Now, statecraft, state formation, political thought is entirely based on the concepts of Christianity, on the cost concepts of Abrahamic thought, which we will see here how it comes about. Because the root of Christianity is in a very important Abrahamic concept of monotheism, which is the old Judaic system or which we call Semitic system. In the Semitic system, there is a covenant between people and an all-powerful creator. There is only one all-powerful creator. For the Jews, it would be Yehovah. For Christians, it would, be, it would be God. And for Muslims, it would be Allah. These are all Abrahamic creeds. So, there is one all-powerful creator. And there are some people who follow this all-powerful creator and worship this all-powerful creator. And the all-powerful creator, Jehovah, God, Allah, makes a covenant, a promise, comes into an agreement with these people, his worshippers. So this is known as a kind of Semitic exclusivity. Now, pagan Rome, pre-Christian Rome, was not in this concept. We did not understand this concept of covenant, of monotheism, of an all-powerful God. In Greece, there is Mount Olympus, on which there is Jews, there is, there is Apollo, there are so many gods. There are goddesses, there are so many goddesses. Athena, the goddess of war. And in Rome, there are so many gods, Jupiter, etc. There are so many gods. So, so the Europeans didn't understand this Semitic concept, this Abrahamic concept of an all-powerful God and the covenant, the agreement, this all-powerful God makes with his worshippers, his followers. But when the Roman Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian, the entire Roman Empire and a big part of Europe, which was under the Roman Empire, begins to follow this monotheistic, this covenant form of rule. Now the role of church becomes very, very important. In medieval Europe, the church, the pope, controls all aspects of political life as well as religious life. Hence, the politics and religion become one. But European mindset, as we have seen from pagan times, from ancient times, from the times of Socrates, Plato, European mind does not like it. And so from medieval period onwards, there is a constant struggle between church and the king or the political authority. The political authority does not want to combine or to have somebody poking nose in day-to-day -day administrative activities as well as telling the king or the administrator or the power, political power, to do this, to do that. And how? As per the church, as per the Bible, or as per the commandments, as per the theology. Because theological aspects and philosophical aspects have to be separated. But now in Middle Ages, we find the concept of the divine king. Now this is very important. The concept of divine king, the divine right to rule, the church, the pope appointing and anointing kings, this has continued even today. As we said, the continuities and changes in European political thought, this is another of the continuities we find that even today, the king or the queen of England is anointed, crowned, by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Church of England. So the Church of England crowns the King or Queen of England. But we all know England is the birthplace of parliamentary democracy. Then how does this happen? This is another legacy. This is another legacy of European political thought that the Church has the divine authority, the divine authority which rules this earth. The King has to rule by divine authority, authority given by the church, given by God, given by Jesus Christ. And this is the Abrahamic or the Semitic thought in which there is monotheism and the agreement made. This concept of agreement or covenant that people make with God is filtered into European thought when we find that in 1215 in England, there is a very important document. This is another 
very important aspect of European political thought, which is Magna Carta. In 1215, King John of England is forced by his people to make an agreement with the people. The king is made to make, is forced to make an agreement with the people. Because the people say, you have an agreement with the church. This is the concept of covenant. The people say, King John, you have an agreement with the church. The church has an agreement with God. So God's power comes to church. Church's power comes to the king. But the king cannot rule just like that. The king ultimately is ruling over the people. People also must have an agreement with the king. If the church is the servant of God, the God has an agreement with church. If the king is the servant of the church, the king has an agreement or an understanding with the church. If people are the servant of the king, then king must come into an agreement with the people. And this is Magna, Magna Carta. This is the a very important concept of European political thought. They understand that there are different powers. There is a political power, the king. There is a church, the divine power. Divine power comes to political power. If the political power has to function, it must have the agreement or the willingness of the people. And this is called Anglo-Saxon democracy. Magna Carta is basically called Anglo-Saxon democracy because Magna Carta was formulated in Anglo-Saxon England before the Norman conquest in England. So in Magna Carta, the people make an agreement with the king with the concept that I just told you that if you have to rule the people, you derive your power from church. Well, good, no problem. You derive, you take your power from the church. We are not going to remove you. King will remain sacred. The king will remain divine. No problem, not an issue. But how will you rule over us, the people? You will rule over us through common law, through our practices. People as we live, our practices you cannot destroy. Again, the seeds of the separation of church and uh, a king are again sowed. This reflects after 200 years into the reformation of Martin Luther and Calvin, when the church itself breaks into two parts. The one part becomes Protestant, another part, part remains Catholic. So when the Protestant church takes over, the kings now find a very easy tool. The kings now find a very easy tool to oppose the Catholic church, the Pope in Vatican. Because it now, it, it is now, 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 in a, in a way, the Catholic, uh, the Pope, the Catholic Church doesn't have any monopoly over divinity. Before the Protestant Church, the Catholic Pope had a monopoly over divinity. Only the Pope had the power of the God with him. Now the Protestant Church has it. Now there are many Protestant churches. There is an Anglican Church. There is a Church of Holland. There is a Church of Germany. There are so many, there are Calvinist churches, there are Lutheran churches. So the moment the monopoly of the Catholic Church is broken, the kings find it very easy to become absolute, absolutist. <laughs>
the Spanish kings and queens would be promoted by the Catholic Church. Henry VIII and the Tudors and the Stuarts of England would be promoted by the Anglican Church, which is the Protestant Church. So England and Spain would be fighting. This fight would be between the Catholics and the Protestants. Even today we find the, the problem of Ireland and England. England is Protestant, Anglican Church, but Ireland is Catholic. So the Irish freedom movement, the, 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 the conflict between Ireland and England basically boils down to the, the, the fight or, or, or the struggle between Catholics and Protestants. Ireland is Catholic, England is Protestant. It all comes to an head in the middle of the 17th century by 1658, by 1648, by 1650s. It all comes to an head and we find ultimately all the kings of Europe coming together. Forgetting their Protestant and Catholic struggle and the, 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 the warfare between each other, the, the Dutch uh, uh, Protestant king is fighting the Italian uh, Catholic king. Uh, the, the, the king, the, the Catholic king of Spain is fighting the Protestant king of England. So this, this is the period called the Thirty Years' War. In the middle of the 17th century, after the Thirty Years' War, there is a Treaty of Westphalia. In the Treaty of Westphalia, all the kings come together of Europe. And then they decide that we will not go on fighting amongst ourselves because ultimately what is happening is that the various churches are using the kings to promote their own power, economic wealth, etc., etc., their followers, etc., etc. So the kings then decide and, for the, and after the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, Europe never undertakes another, another, Catholic Protestant war. After this, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia, the next great watershed in European political thought state formation is the French Revolution. After the French Revolution, after, after this Renaissance Reformation, the conflict between church and the state, absolute state, the absolute uh, uh, the, the divine right of kings, the absolute dictatorship, enlightened despotism, etc., etc., we come to French Revolution. After the French Revolution, another important concept in Europe arises, which is the concept of the nation state. Now the state is a nation state. It is based on nationality. Nationality is same language, same religious denomination, same food habits, same dress, same history, same collective memory, a uniformity, a uniformity which congeals into a nation. And this nation has the power, the political power, and it's a nation state. Now, nation state, after the French Revolution, is totally based on the concept of republic. Now, this republic is again going back to the, the ancient past of Greece and Rome. But in this nation state, not only the free citizens, but even the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, the lower classes, the businessmen, everybody has political power. Everybody has the right to vote and everybody can participate in all the decision making of the state. This concept of nation state is exported, is, is taken throughout Europe by Napoleon. Napoleon puts this idea of nation state in all the countries that he invades and he conquers. Modern European concept is a state which has as its basis rationality, science and logic, simple pure logic. What makes people happy? Now, when we come to this, the la last invention of the Europeans, basically in political thought, in, 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 in the basis of political thought, apart from all the institutions that they create and apart from all the things that they create, European Union, this, that, European Union they have created. But in conceptual terms, the last invention that the Europeans make is the separation of powers between judiciary, legislature, and the executive. And this invention is made after the French Revolution. In another system, the communist system, after French Revolution, this capitalistic free world system, where a separation of uh, power is done between legislature, executive and judiciary, another system was the communist system, which was an entirely totalitarian system. In the communist system, all the rights and all the powers of the citizens are taken over by the state. 
because the state thinks that if the state is all powerful then only it can ensure freedom enjoyment and well-being of the citizens now this is the basic contradiction of european thought i don't think they have found an answer to it this is a big paradox in front in in, in before european state formation in even after forming the eu they have not found the solutions they formed such a big european union such a big uh, uh, a, in, in fact a democratic system european union is a democratic system but has it found the solutions the solutions of poverty the solution to uh, the rights of the individual to to women to environment all these things have they found a solution no now the role of theology has been taken over by the all powerful state the deep state in europe in america we have the deep state it's an all powerful state that's kind of a religion the communist state that's kind of a religion it's an all powerful totalitarian regime be that of hitler or stalin or now uh, different totalitarian dictatorships the communist regimes is it a failed system the capitalist system ensures certain freedom and rights and liberties to the citizens but again it also believes in the concept that the state has to be powerful the state has to be the guiding principle here we can say that this european way of thinking and state formation is certainly different from the indian way of thinking because our indian way of thinking does not make these distinctions does not make does not make the distinction of theology and philosophy philosophy is part of theology because is part of religion religion is full of is is a, is a concept of justice and people have the authority in the indian system there is no distinction between state and the people the state if there is a distinction between state and the people then there is always a, a room left for contradiction for conflict for conflict what are the rights of the state what are the rights of the citizen what are the duties of the citizen what are the duties of the state but if state and the citizen is one in one dharmic whole as in in bharat we know it is a one dharmic whole that is the answer maybe we can talk about it in later in a in a later class thank you so much